Hi, Jeff Spira back again, and today uh, is the uh, second class in the Seamanship and Boating Safety course. And today I want to talk to you about um, nautical terminology. Now, you know, every subject has its own set of specialized terminology. You know, sometimes, uh, you know, people sound like, well, you're trying to talk like a pirate when you use all these strange terms, you know, so. But uh, it's really important to learn what the technology is before you really get started because you need to be able to communicate with people, um, particularly on the radio, <laughs> about what's going on with your boat. You need to understand what they're talking about and they need to understand what you're talking about. So if you can't use the right terms, or the terms mean something other than what you think they mean, um, uh, you need to use them. So uh, the, the terminology for boats and boating is very old, and it's very descriptive, and it means what it means. You know, I mean, it, uh, that's just, that's kind of the way, the way it, <laughs> it has always been, you know, so... Um, it's not just some cute or pretentious thing to do, you know, it's an important part of the seamanship. So, you know, you might call it the pointy end of the boat, but that doesn't really tell anyone anything, you know, unless you're in a double ender, you could, both ends could be pointy. So, uh, <laughs> so anyway, um, so we're going to, we're going to get into some of the, uh, some of the main, um, terminology. Now in general, um, boats are broken down into power boats or sailboats. Um, and there are also ones kind of in between called motor sailors, but they're predominantly sailboats that have some power boat features. So, so let's start with power boats. Um, the common type of power boat you see all the time are called runabouts. And this is just a open boat with a windshield typically. Um, and, uh, um, that uh, that's that's you know very common. A lot of the old time boats were built that way. Not nearly as common today as they once were um, because they've kind of been taken over by boats that have a center console as opposed to a runabout windshield. And those are typically called center console boats. And there are usually walk around consoles in the middle where you can sit and maybe uh, maybe there's a seat in front of the console where. A couple other people can sit, but you walk all the way around uh, the center console, and um, uh, that means you can fish around it, or you know, you know, climb around it to get to uh, you know a float or or um, someone that's that's uh, in the water because you've been water skiing or something like that. So it's a very handy way of doing it. So now, if the boat has um, living space underneath. Uh, it's usually referred to as a cabin cruiser. Okay, um, now cabin cruisers uh, sometimes have have uh, smaller cabins called cuddy cabins, and but they also may have um, you know a full stand up cabin in it with perhaps a, uh, a, a pilot house in there where you can drive the boat from inside the cabin, and that's typically called a pilot house or a cabin cruiser. Sometimes cabin cruisers have elevated uh, steering stations on top of the uh, of the cabin, and uh, uh, that's typically called uh, that, those are those are typically called a uh, flying bridge cabin cruiser. Okay. Now some of the larger boats uh, sometimes they call them sport fishing boats, and these are typical offshore sport fishing boats. They almost always have a cabin. Um, sometimes they have a steering station inside the cabin, but more often than not, they have a steering they have a steering station in a in a flying bridge. Um, a lot of times they have a tower on them, so they can you can put uh, outriggers to fish with and things like that on there. Sometimes there's a tuna tower way up high that's elevated off the above the flying bridge uh, where you can drive the boat as well. So. Um, and then, of course, the bigger boats yet are, are you, you refer to as yachts, and, and they're just, uh, you know, big cabin cruisers, essentially, uh, sometimes multiple decks, sometimes, you know, uh, bridges on them, you know, flying bridges, sometimes all kinds of things, but uh, 
But if it's large and, and you know, uh, has a lot of, uh, uh, you know, extra, extra space, it's typically referred to as a yacht. There's a lot of difference between what separates a real yacht from, from what some people call a yacht as well, too. So. Now let's get into the commercial boats. Um, the most common one that you see around a lot of ports is a commercial fishing boat. And they use, uh, typically they use either nets or sometimes lines um, to catch fish. And their, their, their intent is to go out and catch fish and bring them back and sell them. Another boat you see an awful lot is uh, our tugboats. Now, there's two types of tugs. Some tugs are used offshore and they're used for pulling barges uh, from place to place. A barge is an unpowered sort of flat uh, structure that, uh, that you can pile lumber on or oil or a lot of things and then the barge will tow it around or push it around. There's push barges as well. Those are common in uh, rivers. Um, but around harbors, tugs usually push big ships in to make sure they, they fit into parking spaces appropriately. So they'll assist a larger ship by, uh, by pushing on it and pulling on it and, and uh, helping, it, uh, helping it dock in, in restrained areas. Those are called harbor tugs. Okay. Um, now, you, you also may see large... Uh, larger ships out at sea, if you, if you go out there, and they're typically commercial ships. Um, a lot of times they are, uh, these days, they're either tankers that hold oil or other liquids, or they're uh, container ships, and the container is, is, a, is a box that they set on the decks, and they stack up container ships. Uh, they stack up containers on container ships and move them from port to port. Where, so instead of carrying the bulk of the cargo separately, so um, there um, there are also a type of ship called a row row vessel, which is roll on roll off, and they, these are used. Uh, you see these a lot in the Pacific for bringing cars from uh, Asia. You know, from Japan, for instance, you know, they'll, they'll be, uh, they make a 10-day round trip and it's full of, it's got 3,000 automobiles in it coming from the factories in Asia to the U.S. And uh, um, you also may run into military ships out at sea. And uh, these are uh, they're typically gray colored uh, and they're uh, Navy ships. Usually they have numbers on them and, and uh, you know, a lot of times you see guns hanging off of them and other other funny radars and masts and all kinds of strange things on them. And uh, and these are these are obviously uh, fighting ships. You know, that cruise around. Um, okay, well then then we come into the sailboats and the sailboats typically make their way instead of using an engine to power them around, they use uh, sails. So there are. Um, a uh, common method of, of using sails is, is to use them in a sloop configuration. And a sloop means there's one uh, main sail, and then there's usually, there's oftentimes a jib forward of that. That's called a foresail or a jib. Um, sometimes you'll see, um, you'll see the, the, the sloop uh, uh, main sail comes to a point at the top, and that's typically referred to as a masthead sloop or Marconi sloop. But if it if it has a kind of a square top and it's got another another uh, you know mast type spar up there holding the top part of the sail, it's usually referred to as a gaff rig sloop. Okay. Um, now, if you put it if you take a sloop and you put two uh, forward sails on it. Uh, two head sails, they'll, they'll get, call it a cutter, typically, and that's a, uh, it's a, it's a common uh, approach to a, a, to a, um, a cruising type uh, sloop. It's not, they're typically not uh, um, racing sloops, they're typically cruising sloops, and, it's, and having two head sails makes, uh, makes it easier to handle, particularly if you're alone. Um, I mean, if I were going to cross the the uh, the ocean alone, I would I would want a cutter rig, so because it's the easiest to handle with the, the least amount of work. So, um, 
if they have two masts and the, and the forward one is taller and the aft one is shorter, it's referred to as a catch. Now a catch has a, um, a lot, has more area and the area is lower. So it, it, uh, it again, this is a, a very common way to have a cruising, uh, cruising boat. It's not as easy to handle as a cutter for one person, but if you've got a number of people aboard, it becomes a very easy to use offshore rig. Uh, with uh, and the, the the forward mast in this case is called the main mainsail, and uh, it, it it will have one or two jibs attached to it usually, and the aft mast is called the mizzen. So those are the those are the the uh, the two main the two fore and aft sails, and then the uh, the two jibs that go on it. So now sometimes if the if the aft sail uh, on a two-masted boat is is aft of the rudder post. It's, it's, that's the, the typical example they, they use, but um, it's called a, a yawl. Um, and yawls are, are very, uh, they're good long-distance uh, cruisers, and, and some of the early sailors set up a yawl rig on some of their boats to keep them pointed in the same direction where they didn't have to attend to driving them nearly as much. But other than that, yawls are, are not very common these days. It's not a common approach, but it's still, um, it, it, they still exist. Now, now in a two-masted uh, sailboat with the aft mast taller, the aft mast is called the main, main sail. And, uh, and the forward mast is called the foresail. Um, and those are, those typically you, you would call a schooner. That's a schooner rig. You know, um, with the uh, shorter forward mast and the taller aft mast, and the main mast, and um, and schooners are are very popular. There again, it's an older rig. It's not a speed rig necessarily, um, but it's a very classy looking boat to to see come by, and it's very, uh, um, you know, it's it just gives you images of exploring the briny sea, you know, of a schooner coming by. It's, uh, um, it has a lot of advocates still today, you know, with the schooner rig. Um, now, if you see three, three sails and they, they're, they're uh, square sails, um, it's called a ship rig. And that's where the term ship originally came from. The old, um, the, the old square rigger uh, boats were called were called ships and different kinds. It was a cutty, you know, a, I mean, a, uh, I'm sorry, a, uh, hmm. it'll come to me, but <laughs> there's, there's a, there's a whole bunch of different arrangements of ships, but typically they're three masted ships with all square sails. And then they, they may have uh, several jibs and then, um, and, and a few other types of sails that they could hang when the, when the wind was good and they wanted to take advantage of it and that sort of thing. But that's typically a ship rig. But again, those are, those are of historical interest, but they're not of much use to the modern day, um, you know, the modern day sailor, unless you're, unless you're really into, you know, creating a pirate ship or something, you know, <laughs> something unusual. So, um, okay, well, let's talk about parts of a powerboat. Um, you know the, the 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 right way to address the directions, for instance, is is uh, is the bow of the boat is the is the forward end, the pointy end, okay, and the stern is the aft end. So that's the that's the uh, the, the, the back part of the boat, if you wish. Uh, so it has um, it has a uh, you know. Forward, aft, bow, and stern. So those are those are the directions and and the names of the boat in those things. Now the boat has an you know uh, a, a length that that is typically overall length and waterline length. Those are the two lengths that you have on the boat. So one is how how long is the boat where it touches the water, and the other part of it is uh, what's the overall length from the from the farthest part forward to the farthest part aft. Um, I might point out that if you were uh, to rent a space, they, they would measure your boat. They would sell you the space. I mean, I'm talking about a slip in, in most of the 
uh, the marinas around around here in Southern California for sure, is they don't tell you, you don't tell them that I have a 23 foot boat. They go, they go out and measure it. And if it has a, a, a projection sticking out the front where the, where the anchor's uh, rolling on, or, and it's also got a, say a swim step aft uh, where uh, uh, that sticks out that direction. Um, those are added to the to the actual hull length and then so you have to pay for the overall length and that's that's a, a little bit different than than what you think the boat's length is so um now also boats have a port and starboard side um it, 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 they don't have a left side and a right side they've got a port and a starboard side the port side is to the left as you face forward but if you're facing aft, the port, the port side's on the right. <laughs> so that, that dis distinguishes the difference between right and left and port and starboard. So the port is always the left side of the boat when you're looking at the bow of the boat. When you're standing on the boat and looking, looking forward, the port is the left side, the starboard is the right side. Um, again, that as the boat rotates around, as it's passing you, you have to keep that in mind, which is the port, which is the starboard, not which is the, on the left and which is on the right, you know, so, um, anyway, um, and the width of the boat typically is the beam of the boat. That's the widest part. And the amount of, uh, water, uh, the amount of, uh, distance that the boat sinks into the water from the from the water line down to the deepest part of the boat is called the draft so that's that's an important piece of terminology there okay well um <clears throat> now power boats are either are, are either powered by um one of three ways the first is, and the most common way for smaller boats is, is an outboard motor. And this is typically a, a motor that's designed to be a boat motor. And it's, uh, it's usually hung on the transom, but it could also be put in a well, a motor well in the boat. But uh, the outboard is, uh, is a package deal. It's, a, it's an engine and it's a transmission and it's a drive propeller and everything all rolled into one neat package. That's called an outboard. Um, some in, and also there's a, the second way of doing it and the, the traditional way is an inboard where the engine is inside the boat and it runs through a transmission, uh, you know, forward and aft transmission. And then it runs through a log with, which is a hole in the boat that's sealed. Uh, so water doesn't come in and, uh, through it, it down a shaft, the power runs down a shaft to a propeller that's, that's in the water outside the, the hull of the boat. So that would be referred to as an inboard. Now they also have, and they were popular for some time, but they're, they're kind of falling from favor these days. They had inboard outboards where they had an inboard motor engine, and then they had an outboard drive system. And they used to do that because, um, because outboard motors weren't as reliable as they are now. So they, the inboards were always more reliable motors. Uh, but uh, uh, but the but the uh, outboard was more uh, had more uh, maneuverability. So it would it would because you turn the propeller as you turn the motor, it would uh, it it tended to be a better way to drive the boat. But uh, uh, but the engines weren't weren't that reliable because they were typically two-stroke motors, and uh, you know they didn't they weren't as they weren't as uh, Efficient as modern, uh, you know, modern outboards, which are typically four-stroke motors. So, um, but uh, but they they had a combination of inboard outboard, where you had an inboard motor, which was typically from a car, and then an outboard drive, which was a separate thing that you would drive through a shaft and then you know, hold in the transom, and it would go into the to the outboard motor, uh, outboard transmission and, and uh, steering system. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about the parts of a, of a sailboat. Now, a sailboat, like a powerboat, also has a bow and a stern, exactly the same. It's got a, uh, it's got the waterline length and the, uh, and the overall length. Um, 
but it also has the sail rigging. So the uh, the mast on a on a uh, sailboat is called the, the it's the vertical element that hold that stands up, and that's called the mast. That holds the uh, the, the sail typically slides up and down the mast. Uh, sometimes on a on a carrier uh, rack, you know, type uh, uh, thing that keeps it in place. And sometimes they put loops around the mast uh, that are made out of line that uh, that that you can uh, you know allow the main sail to get pulled up and pulled down. Now the vertical elements uh, of the uh, of the uh, of the rigging that hold the mast up are called stays. And there's a head stay, and an aft stay, a back stay, uh, spreaders and side stays. And there's, a, there's all kinds of, uh, of different terms for the, the naming of the different stays, but they are essentially what's called standing rigging. You tighten them up and it holds the mast in place and it also distributes the load from the sails through the mast and back down to the hull. So uh, those those never change in that standing rigging. You don't adjust as you're sailing or anything like that. Well, I shouldn't say that. There's in some in some types of sailboats you would need to adjust it, but it's it's it'd be very unusual. So in most small sailboats. Now the horizontal um, spar that uh, is holds the on the underside of the sail is called the boom, and the boom. Uh, you know, holds the the sail from flying up from the from the rigging there. So, um, it, typically on a on a on a your average um, you know sloop, you have one mast and one boom, and that's it. Now, there's there's a few other detailed things that you can talk about, but but uh, right now that, that that's good enough to know. Now, there's a mast and a boom. On a catch, you would have two masts and two booms. Uh, you know, on a schooner, you would all have the same two masts and two booms. So. Um, now, the lines that you pull the, the sails up and down with uh, are called halyards. So those are the, those are the, the, the ones that when you raise the, the sail, you would pull on the, on the main halyard and it would lift the sail up the mast. And, and then you would tie it off as it got to its full height. Um, you could also lower it a little bit uh, and, and take up some space. There's other, there's, other, there's other tricks of the trade to do that. But typically when you're gonna raise the mast, uh, when you raise the sails on a, on a sailboat, you, uh, you would pull the halyard and it would open the mast uh, up and, and you would extend the, and then you would tie the, the, the halyard uh, off um, to a to a uh, cleat, and then the sail would be up, and it would be it would stay up. And then when you come in and you want to lower the sail, you just uh, loosen the the cleat and you let the halyard down. Now there's a there's a um, there's a halyard for the jib as well that pulls the jib up and uh, and holds it in place. Um, and then, then you know, so those those only move when you're putting up or taking down the uh, the sails. Now, normally when you sail, you use what are called sheets. Now, the sheets are lines or ropes, in other words, that attach to the the boom or the uh, or the uh, jib and and you use those to adjust the direction of the sails as you as you uh, move them about so as you change direction you would uh, you would adjust the sheets so that the sail was catching the wind the way you want it to and uh, and and then use those sheets to to uh, you know to sail that direction and then if you change it you would adjust those sheets so that it, that it would hold the sail in the, in the opposite direction or whichever direction you're going so those those are the ones that get maneuvered as you're sailing are the are the main sheet and the and the jib sheet so um that's probably good enough for uh for that we could get into the details of what you call different different uh, elements of the of the sail and, and there's tricks to the rigging and all that but i'm not going to get to those in this uh 
in this class at all because it's uh, it's basically uh, th those are those are you know details about how to sail. Now a sailboat, uh, it, you know, doesn't really um, it doesn't work like a like a kite, for instance. Um, you, you know, people think of, of um, you just, if the wind's blowing, you just hold up a big wide piece of cloth and then the wind catches the cloth and off you go. <clears throat> a sailboat works more like a, uh, an airplane wing. So the fastest uh, direction you can go in a sailboat is across the wind. So you would, you would adjust the sails so that it would, it's called a beam reach when you're going, the wind is coming from the side of the boat and coming past you and then you, you tweak the sails so that you create a lot of uh, lift in the direction you're going and, um, and uh, not so much uh, uh, force in the, in the sideways direction which is where uh, you know your, your, the shape of the hull prevents you from sliding sideways but the, uh, but the, but the direction of travel is always, is always at 90 degrees to the wind. So that's called um, that's called a, a, a beam reach is what it's, it's is the right terminology for that. It can be either direction. This, the wind could be coming from either side of the boat. It doesn't really matter. And as you as you point forward into the wind with the sailboat, um, then that's called a close reach, and you tweak in the the sails. You pull them in, and and you create a a little bit different uh, shape of wing that, that the, the wind is seeing. And so that would drive you forward and, and into the wind. Now typically a um, sailboat can sail about 45 degrees off the wind, which means it's you're, you're halfway into the wind and halfway, um, you know, with the wind. So um, you, some of, some of the, the racing sailboats can point higher than that. They can point up to, you know, 22, 24 degrees off the wind, but uh, it's, it's a little bit unusual. But, um, but you can actually point upwind, and, uh, and that's uh, where the whole point of, of, uh, of tacking is called. So if you're, if you're going, if you're going, you want to go into the wind, you go uh, 45 degrees to the wind for a while, and then you switch over and go 45 degrees into the wind the other direction, and you kind of zigzag your way into the wind and you can actually go upwind that way, uh, directly upwind uh, because you have to, you know, go back and forth basically into the wind. And if you turn around and, uh, and go the other way with the wind, uh, you can throw the sails out so that they catch the wind more like a kite and that's called a broad reach and, uh, and it pulls you, it pulls you downwind and it's a, it's a different feeling in a sailboat because you don't really notice the wind. Uh, you're moving along nearly the speed of the wind, so it's a very different sensation than if you're pointing upwind uh, in, in, when, as you're sailing the boat. So um, Anyway, and you can also run fully downwind where you throw one sail one direction and the other sail the other, and that's called running wing and wing. And it's a, it's a you know, a, a, a way to run uh, downwind, but again, it's not as fast as going sideways to the wind. But if you if you need to go that direction, that's the way to go. So, um, okay. Well, now there's there's if we if we go into I mean I could we could get into details of, about how to sail, and I, that's not again that's not the intent. But I just kind of wanted to familiarize you with with how the sailboat is actually steered. And, uh, and driven and why the sails are, are shaped the way they are, that sort of thing. So, um, so let's talk about boat hulls. There, there's, really, um, there's really two general shapes for boat hulls. One is called a displacement hull and the other is called a planing hull. Now a displacement hull means that uh, it displaces water. So as you, it, it, it's, it, it ends up being like a, a hull that's pointy on both ends. Um, I mean, it doesn't have to be pointy. The hull itself could be, uh, the top sides could be shaped like a boat but it, it, with, a, with a flat transom. But the 
water line would be uh, like a f shaped like a football, and that would that would dictate a, a, a displacement hull. Now displacement hulls are very limited in the speed they can go because they, they create um, a uh, um, they create a ripple on top of the water. Uh, it's it's really called a bow wake and a and a stern wake, and um, and what happens is if, if they get too far, those bow wake and stern wake get too far apart, which means you're moving too fast for the length of the boat, then the boat tends to squat. It, it tends to ride and you end up going uphill. So there comes to be a point where uh, no matter how much additional power you can put on them, uh, they still can't really go any faster. They consume a lot more power and they end up, they end up doing a lot more work, but they're not really going much faster. And that the speed that they can go reliably is called the, the hull speed. And this is a pretty small number. I mean, on, on you know, small boats, 16, 18 feet, that, you know, it's only about five miles an hour is the hull speed. That's all they can do. Um, uh, now, the longer the boat gets, the higher the hull speed. You know, you got a, a you know, a, a, like the old clipper ships, you know, they were they were uh, 200 feet long and they were narrow, so they they had a they had a very like a knife going through the water, and very long, so their hull speeds were very high. They could go 25 knots in a hull speed uh, without without too much uh, trouble, and uh, uh, so they they uh, they were much much faster ships the longer you get. And that's why you see you know some of these uh, old time. Uh, power boats that were very very efficient are very long and very narrow. You know, they, they were there were a lot of them were 65 foot uh, boats with uh, you know th three or four foot of beam, and uh, you know they were for one or two people, and uh, and they they had you know a two horsepower motor on them, and they would do you know 12, 14, 16 knots. So that was uh, that's that's how that that whole displacement hull thing works. Uh, the longer the hull the faster it's able to go without creating this, uh, you know, bow and stern wake interference. So. But if you were to take a boat and, and you would, you know, chop off the stern section and make it flat back there, it ends up turning into a planing hull. So what happens with a planing hull is if you get more power on it, it rises up and skims over the water. And, uh, you know, it, it requires a wider transom and with less, uh, you know, curvature to it. So, so it's looking for a sharp edge back there. And then you can go over the, the, uh, plane, the, the displacement speed and start planing the hull. And then it, it skips across the top of the water like a, you know, like a, or like a rock or a pebble that you would, uh, you know, spin and throw it across the top and skip it across the top of the water. So it would, uh, it tends to rise up and, and able to go much faster than the hull speed. And that's why most small boats these days, particularly ones that have more power, tend to be planing hulls. Um, there's a, there's a diff there's a in-between sort of thing uh, that you can get, uh, you can get, um, you come across, and that's called a, uh, a, a semi-planing hull or a semi-displacement hull. I call them semi-displacement hulls a lot on my on my uh, um, on my my website. Um, and a lot, what that really means is that it it's a hull that will displace okay. It'll it'll do okay when it's displacing. Um, it won't be as efficient as a full displacement hull, but it'll still able to displace without using too much power and it'll also be able to get up on a plane if you give it additional power so I tend to like to design these um, because they tend to be very efficient boats and they tend to be good sea crossing boats you know I can get up you know I've got uh, you know I got 18 foot boats with 40 horsepower that'll do 35 knots you know <laughs> and uh, and you know so um, they, 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 they tend to be they tend to be really good in the mid sizes in the 25 foot range you know something like in there and, and larger and so I have I have a number of boats that'll do well in that range with uh, so that you can run them on a minimal amount of power but if needed you can you can pour the coals to them and get them get them up on a, on a somewhat of a plane and and get home in a hurry without 
chewing up too much fuel. So um, my uh, camera ran out of battery last time, so I'm I'm trying to get it all squared away this time. So anyway, let's talk about some other terminology that you're going to need to know about. Um, let's begin with the term breakwater. Now you may have heard the term breakwater. Well, what it refers to is a rock wall that uh, holds back the waves and it kind of serves to isolate a harbor so that there's no waves coming into the harbor. Um, typically it's broken up rocks, but in some places like Japan, they use uh, concrete, uh, you know, structures. They use a concrete uh, um, big uh, jack sort of shaped, you know, the kids jacks, you know, the girls jacks that they used to play with. Uh, they're shaped like that and they're just, they're made out of concrete and they all pile up and fit together. So it serves to break the waves. So that's why it's called a breakwater. Now, if they fill up behind the breakwater, sometimes it could be, you know, stone or it could be something like uh, a concrete, you know, blocks or a concrete wall or whatever. And they fill uh, dirt in behind it. It's usually referred to as a seawall so that they'll, they'll make, they'll turn that into a seawall. Um, now, in some places, they use uh, they use uh, pilings and and they set up tall uh, piers, which are really um, wooden structures that uh, that are attached to the bottom of the ocean and, they, and through pilings that are driven down. Uh, could be uh, metal, could be wood, could be uh, concrete. Uh, and then, but they, they don't float up and down on the water. They're usually set up fairly high so that the tide can go in and out uh, from, um, from under the pier. So it'll, the water level will raise and lower. So sometimes they use them for fishing. Sometimes they use them for anchoring boats, uh, other things like that. Now, if the, if the pier has an area where, um, or, or, or the marina, for instance, has an area where they have docks that float and they just kind of float up and down and they're usually held in place with pilings that uh, prevent them from, uh, from moving um, that you can tie boats to. That's usually called a dock. Um, okay, well, um, now going in and out of harbors and also uh, in various points around uh, um, you know, the ocean or, 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 you know, other, other bodies of water, um, they'll put up what are called, what we call here in the U S call them buoys. It's, uh, B O B I'm sorry, B U O Y. We say buoy. I think they say boy in England and probably, uh, in down under as well, they call it a boy. Um, but it's uh, in the U.S. and Canada, it's typically called a buoy. And uh, these are uh, just floating structures. They're usually anchored in place to the bottom. And uh, they'll often have different uh, features on them, like bells or, or uh, sometimes horns or uh, lights on top. So they'll have lights and numbers on them so you can identify which buoy you're looking at because the light will be indicated on the, on the nautical chart or um, you know it, it'll be it'll be shown what number is on it and, and what color the light and the frequency of the flashing is sometimes it'll be a green light that goes off every you know five seconds or something like that or it'll be a red light that goes every every 10 seconds now that'll all be marked on it and, and I'll, we'll get into that and how you read those uh, devices when we when we get into the navigation portion of these classes. So um, the, the buoys that mark channels, uh, they're, they're red on one side and green on the other. The red ones are, uh, are usually cylindrical, they're round, and the green ones are usually uh, uh, tapered to a, they come to a point. They're, they're, uh, so, so you can tell them apart just from the shape without even noticing the uh, the color of the light on top, or the, or the, uh, uh, you know, the, the actual light that, or the shape, or the color of the buoy. So, anyway, 
Um, the, the normal routine on that is, is called red right return. You keep the red buoy on your right side when you're returning to port or going into port. And the same way going out, uh, going out of port, the red would be on the left side. Um, so, and the and green would be on the right in that case. So, so you go between the red and the green to stay within the channel. And a lot of times this is really important to stay within the channel because you don't want to risk running up in shoal water, in shallow water. So, so you try and stay between the red and green buoys when you're going in and out of port. Now, if you have a little, very light boat that's a flat bottom or something, you might not have to worry too much about it, but, uh, um, you know, if you know your way around. But if in most cases, I would I would recommend that you that you always stay between the buoys. That's the that's the correct way to do it from a boating uh, you know seamanship operations uh, viewpoint. So going in and out of the channel. Um, sometimes there are 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 very much brighter lights that can be seen a great distance, and oftentimes they're they're elevated on the top of points and stuff like that. And, they, and it, typically they rotate, but you only see them as a flash of white light. But it would be um, typically those those are called lighthouses and uh, and the timing is usually in, indicated in there. The typical timing on a lot of lighthouses in the, in the ocean are, uh, you know, like 20 seconds or 22 seconds or something. And you count off the, the amount of time between the flashes and uh, determine the number of seconds, and then you can tell one lighthouse from another. So that's that's kind of the theory of how that works. Uh, again, we'll get into that when we start getting into the uh, uh, you know the the regular navigation portion of this, you know, the pilotage part of the of the course. So um, those are those are a couple other terminology items that you need to know before we get too far. Too much farther, and uh, so uh, commit those to memory, and uh, and then we'll uh, catch up with you again on the second part of this, where we're going to start talking about the rules of the road. Okay, well, thank you for watching, and we'll talk to you again soon.